Do not ice bath for recovery if what you're trying to do is build muscle mass. If, I don't know, you're in the Tour de France and you just finished a leg and you want to bring yourself back up to performance level right away, the ice bath can help you with that. But it will not help you with the anabolic gains. Huberman says wait four or five hours, which sounds like really good advice. But if what you're going for is to correct your testosterone level, I'm now 57, I just remeasured. I was like 1100, 1040, something like this. It's still over a thousand, which many people consider exceptional. And I'm thinking, I don't feel exceptional. It seems achievable, but it takes time. When you're gonna do this for anabolic gains, Use exercise to recover from the cold, not the other way around. Today's show with Dr. Tom Seeger is brought to you by Myoscience Nutrition. As you can tell, we're talking a lot about the science linked with deliberate cold exposure and its improvements in vitality, exercise recovery, and possibly improving hormone levels like testosterone, a tool that our customers over at Myoscience have reported a lot of beneficial feedback from lately is the morning wood. I know it sounds a little bit crazy. This is a bovine testicular extract, but the feedback has been phenomenal from real people just like you who are trying to optimize sexual performance, improvements in the bedroom, and having feelings and more vigor when it comes to exercise as well. So for best practices with morning wood, what we hear from customers is dosing between two and four capsules in the evening time. I've been trying two to four capsules as well in the morning in addition to the evening dosages. And what I've heard from customers who have literally called in to our customer service center is they notice improvements in blood flow and the hardness, if you will, of their erections and better sexual performance. Honestly, it's usually their sexual partner that notices a difference and provides that feedback to the customer, and they have reported that back to us, which is quite phenomenal. So you can look at the reviews over at myoscience.com on Morning Wood. You can save using the code podcast at checkout. Again, that's podcast over at myoscience.com, M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. And we're actually updating this formula to add zinc and some other botanicals that can enhance the efficacy of this. But you can check out the reviews. David recently reviewed just a few days ago. I've been taking three daily and have noticed a difference in my blood flow, uh, referring to... Know, downstairs. Blood flow is better. I had a guy who called me the other day saying that his partner can't even believe the differences in his performance. And so just wanted to share that with you, getting a lot of great feedback. Uh, hopefully you enjoy this show with Tom. Tom is the chief scientific officer over at Moreau's Co. Forge, which is a deliberate cold immersion tank that I've been using since 2021. I think it's one of the best on the market because it actually makes ice. And this is not an infomercial for his product whatsoever. We barely mention it. Just want you to know that you can save using the code. The code to save $350 off your Morozco Forge is HIH350. That code again is HIH350. That is an affiliate link, but I do recommend this particular tank if you're very intentional about getting cold on purpose because this is one of the only at-home units that actually makes ice. And so I like to go in there and I recommend people start out at 10 to 15 seconds, warm up to 30 seconds, and progressively and iteratively improve the duration of time that you're spending in the cold tank for two to four minutes. And so I find a song that's about two, two minutes, 10 seconds long. I have several songs that I oscillate back and forth with. This is something I do first thing in the morning. And I like to do this actually before I exercise. I know that sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but good research shows that if you can keep your body temperature down, you can actually improve your respiratory exchange ratio and exercise economy and actually improve the fat oxidation potentially during exercise if you're cold beforehand. Now, I do like to warm up my joints, my tendons, you know, using exercise bands and so forth before doing heavy loads after doing a deliberate cold exposure session. But I find generally my strength is better. I'm more awake during those exercises exercise sessions and don't need as much coffee or pre-workouts or things like that. So I think you'll enjoy the show with Tom and let's cut back to it. Well, now you can see the connection to cold exposure. Hans Selye and psychologists use thermal contrast as a validated, like standardized measure of stressing either the animals or the human beings. There's something called the cold presser test. Mm. You put your hand into cold water. It used to be they would let you go for five minutes, but now the psychologists are all freaked out and the limit is three minutes, mm. like as if this was dangerous. But most people can't even make it to three. They'll measure your heart rate, your blood pressure, perspiration on the hand that isn't immersed. So measure your physiological responses to stress following in Han Selye's footsteps, they're not really looking for whether your physiological response is beneficial, but they are looking for a measure of your resilience. How well do you adapt to this kind of stress? 
Kelly McGonigal at Stanford wrote a book uh, called The Upside of Stress, and it was a very famous TED talk. She said that we, in the popular consciousness, you know, we all think, well, stress is bad. Oh, this stress is killing me. But she said, no, it is your beliefs about stress. Yeah. Those people who experienced a lot of stress but believe the stress could be good for them, live longer than anybody else did, which ties right back to Selye's idea that stress, you stress, it's called, can be good for you. So what happens when we're getting into the ice bath? We hate it. Mm. Like, I would not recommend this for the pilgrims or something. They didn't have the kind of comfort in their lives that we have. So if our ancestors could find comfort, they would take it. But we... You know, we got our heated leather seats and we got our air conditioning and we need to seek discomfort, which from an evolutionary perspective is not intuitive. We get into the ice bath, we're uncomfortable, even painful sometimes. We can feel the stress. We're experiencing that physiological response. And the point is when we do it deliberately, intentionally, and we give ourselves room to recover from it, it makes us better. More resilient. Yeah. That's, I think, a great launching pad. And I think a lot of people don't recognize uh, that cold has been used in medicine for a very long time. If you get an acute injury, you roll your ankle, you get a burn. I mean, what's the first thing that you do? You get you put ice on it. And the fact that it has the systemic anti-inflammatory benefit, but also to tether on to what you just talked about, uh, improving resilience. And if you look at all the diseases, whether it's diabetes, obesity, heart disease, cancer, these are characterized by lack of resilience, physiologically speaking, where their glucose uh, fluctuations are, are off the charts, where they need to have certain foods, we're also going to have a hypoglycemic crash. And and so by improving uh, resilience, that's where the magic is. And to that point, reframing it in your mind, you know, um, that this short term stressor is adaptive and beneficial, not negative. Um, because I think a lot of people think that, well, cortisol or adrenaline is released from getting cold. And so therefore it's problematic. Uh, if you go to on a run, guess what happens to cortisol or adrenaline? Right. They go up when you get up in the morning, cortisol and adrenaline increase. So uh, exercise, if you were to just look at the hormonal effect of exercise, you would probably never exercise if you viewed <laughs> right. the, you know, the, the hormone shifts through a binary lens. So anyway, getting back to the benefits, um, there's many benefits. I want to get into brown adipose tissue, cold shock proteins, the neurochemical releases, vasopressin, oxytocin. But since we're on resilience, if you were to look at the high level overview of sort of the science of deliberate cold exposure, improving resilience, is, is that up there at the top, would you say? Um, I'd say the metabolism is at the top. And when you've got that, psychological resilience is right underneath there. And you can do metabolism in 50 degree water Fahrenheit. As long as it makes you gasp, a cold shower will help your metabolism. Yeah. But to get that psychological resilience, you've got to go to a temperature that's going to frighten you. This is why I need ice in my ice bath. The, the ice baths that don't have ice aren't ice baths for me. Um, if it's not less than 39 degrees, I don't feel that cold shock response. I don't get so much. I get bored. Mm -hmm. I was talking with Scott Carney about this, who also, he does a lot. He wrote The Wedge. He wrote What Doesn't Kill Us, the story of Im Hof. And he does a lot of cold exposure too. And we agreed 39 is about where we begin to feel it psychologically, if not metabolically. There's some studies on metabolism that show as warm as 60 degrees, you're still getting a great big benefit. This one's out of Germany. They took a group of, I'm going to call them middle-aged because they were a little older than me on average, um, late 50s, type 2 diabetic Germans, and they said, we want you for 10 days. And we're going to put you in cold air. You're not allowed to wear anything but a t-shirt and shorts. You're going to start for two hours in the afternoon. We're going to build you up to six hours. Just going to be like 59 degrees Fahrenheit. They measure it in Celsius. So it was a round number in the study. They measured their insulin sensitivity before and at the end. These guys were not allowed to exercise. They were not allowed to change their diet because that might sort of confound the results. They measured an average 40% improvement in glucose sorry, an insulin sensitivity in glucose uptake. Mm -hmm. Now, many of them dropped out of the type 2 diabetic diagnostic criteria. Essentially, their type 2 diabetes was resolved in 10 days by cold. But when they asked them psychologically, how uncomfortable were you? And there was a distribution. None of them said very uncomfortable. 
they said, well, you know, I, I shivered a little bit sometimes. If we really want to get the psychological resilience, we got to go to the point where we activate the autonomic nervous system, where you get that gasp reflex, where you feel the, I'm not even going to say the cold, it's the fear, mm -hmm. uh, the anxiety that this is going to kill you. And here's how we know. Um, I had to learn a lot from Jay Wiles. He's the chief science officer at Hunu Health. They measure heart rate variability. And he taught me a lot about HRV. It used to be that we think a steady heart rate, you know, that's a good thing. We don't want any irregularities in the heart. That's not true at all. It turns out that the heart is supposed to adapt every breath, every thought, every temperature everything that happens in our lives places a different demand on the heart and when the heart rate can expand or contract and this is measured in microseconds to adjust to the demands that your body um, is experiencing your heart rate variability is a physiological measure of your psychological resilience so what improves heart rate variability cold exposure but not the kind that the Germans were using for their metabolism, the kind that really scares the crap out of you. Mm -hmm. This is why I need ice like bumping up against my neck or look, I know I'm not going to die. Right. I know that I've been through this a hundred times, hundreds of times. Mm -hmm. One of the things that Kelly McGonigal put in her upside of stress book to try and explain the difficulty of the cold pressure test was she said, if you were submerged, up to your neck in ice water, it would kill you in two minutes. Well, I don't know. Yeah. I've been 22 minutes, right? Uh, I think you're wrong there, yeah. <laughs> uh, Professor McGonigal. Yeah. And she's probably never tried it. But when you, but it sure feels like you're going to die in two minutes. It's those feelings that we're trying to activate. That's what sets your brown fat on fire, uh, mm. metaphorically. You know, that's what sure. activates the cold thermogenesis in your brown fat. That's what activates the physiological response, the production of the neurotransmitters and the hormones that your body needs when your fight or flight system is on high alert. So this is the resilience angle. Without the activation of the autonomic nervous system, you're not really getting the psychological workout that you can from the cold. I love that. And the fact that you started out with the improvement in HRV, heart rate variability. Uh, and I think this is now kind of a kitchen table topic for some people. Yeah. And I think it's important to talk about because anytime I post a video on getting in the Morosco Forge or jumping into an Alpine Lake, I see uh, comments, people saying, well, you should not be promoting this for people with um, uh, arrhythmia issues or heart issues. But uh, to, to your point is we are actually improving the, res the beat to beat variability. We're making the heart more resilient. Uh, low heart rate variability is more strongly tethered to poor cardiovascular outcomes. So um, I would like you to, and here's some feedback, you know, for people that maybe have a pacemaker or cardiovascular issues, what is the significant risk? Because I haven't seen this come up in the studies, to the best of my knowledge. Um, even people with congestive heart failure and looking at them, uh, their outcomes going in a hot tub, it's actually favorable. And there's no real risk that I'm aware of. But there's this perception that if you get cold, your heart's going to stop or some such thing. But so what would you say to that comment? Um, well, let's talk about contraindications because yeah. there are some contraindications to cold exposure and nobody who wants to sell you an ice bath is going to tell you about the contraindications except me. Um, the number one is not wanting to do an ice bath, like no coercion, no bullying. You will never see me with a bullhorn yelling at people to get into the ice because it takes away the deliberate component. Mm -hmm. When you come out of the ice, you feel like Superman. Like you can do anything. You got all this energy and this sense of pride. But if you only did it because somebody was coercing or bullying, it diminishes that sense of accomplishment. Um, and you got to come out of your own accord. So mm -hmm. the number one contraindication for me is not wanting to do it. And I'm not trying to talk anybody into doing it. But when you do, go in like you're royalty. Like you are superior to everyone else that you think might be judging you, you know? And you're not worried about looking sloppy or you're feeling like the king. Come out like you're in charge of the world. And this is the, the mindset that will help you through the experience. That's number one. Mm -hmm. 
and there are some others. If you go on Wikipedia, you're going to see that they cite Mike Tipton, who's a scientist in the United Kingdom. He has an extreme environments lab. So he's essentially built a dunk tank, like you might see at the carnival, but he's put it in a laboratory setting where he can monitor human beings who are going to get cold. And Tipton has a theory called autonomic conflict. There are two conflicting responses. One is the gas reflex. You get in mm -hmm. and you can't help but, you know, kind of catch your breath. If you can't structure your breath, you calm yourself down, it's possible to hyperventilate. Mm. Vim's method teaches hyperventilation and it must be kept separate from cold exposure. Do not ever combine hyperventilation and cold exposure. Do not ever breath hold in the cold. I'll, I'll talk about why in a minute. But Tipton says that's the gas reflex. There's a countervailing reflex called the dive reflex. And this happens when your nostrils, any temperature, but your nostrils are covered with water. You automatically shut down your breath. Your heart goes down instead of up. Your metabolism goes into conservation mode. And the evolutionary reason for it is to prepare you to go get the shellfish or spearfish or, I don't know, retrieve your iPhone from the bottom of the lake. Like whatever it is you need to do, your body says you're diving now. You need to hold your breath and that means we got to conserve oxygen. We're going to be building up carbon dioxide and we want to go as slow as we can metabolically so you can do whatever task it is that you've set your mind to. The gasp reflex activates your fight or flight, increases your heart rate. The dive reflex slows your heart rate back down. So we've got some good data from wearables on what happens to heart rate, what happens to continuous glucose monitoring when you get into the ice bath. The first thing is heart rate goes up. Your liver releases glycogen into your bloodstream and that's to fuel your muscles in case you have to fight or flight. That goes up and then it all starts coming back down. Tipton's fear, his hypothesis, is that if you are subject to both the gasp and the dive at the same time, that it will create an autonomic conflict that may cause your heart to skip a beat. And for most people, no big deal. But for those with a history of heart arrhythmia, he's like, we should be very cautious about this. Yeah. Now, there are no documented cases of this heart arrhythmia showing up in the morgue or showing up in the emergency room. But Tipton speculates that some of the people who arrive in the emergency room as drowning victims may actually have been heart arrhythmia, heart irregularity victims who get classified as drowning. And I don't want to dispute the guy who has written more journal articles and is recognized as a leading researcher on human beings and extreme environments. But it's not number one on my list. Mm. The number one is drowning. Mm. Like, baths are dangerous. Mm. Um, forge sober. Uh, supervise your kids. Mm. Like, um, you're talking about water and you should use some of the same precautions that uh, we use when we're swimming or we're, when we're bathing. So drowning and then hyperventilation and breath hold. The thing about hyperventilation is that it will purge the carbon dioxide out of your system and it will, it can shut down the receptors within your own body that give you the urge to breathe. That is, you can pass out before you know you really need to breathe. This is why free diving is so dangerous, especially novice free divers who want to extend their range. They want to set this free diving is um, diving without use of an underwater breathing apparatus. So you're just holding your breath. And some of the records are incredible. But when the free divers hyperventilate to see if they can get to their personal best, they never feel that urge to breathe. They pass out underwater mm. and then they drown. Scott Carney says he's documented over a dozen cases of people who have combined hyperventilation with breath hold and cold exposure and died. And in addition to those dozen cases, some near misses. So where are we coming? There's some safety precautions. Um, go feet first mm -hmm. to minimize Tipton's idea of autonomic conflict. I saw you... Uh, dive right into your forge on a video and it was hilarious video and then at that moment i was like no mike don't you know and then you got right out i mean it, it wasn't the point um, right. you were doing this like very exaggerated thing now i've dove into the cold pacific ocean or the cold atlantic ocean i don't have a heart irregularity and i'm not trying to hyperventilate and hold my breath 
But I advise you go feet first. Feel the gasp reflex, and then let the dive reflex come. If you're gonna, um, if you're gonna do a brief like dunk your face, which I enjoy doing. You're forging sober, and you're breathing. Tipton says when you structure your breath and you breathe continuously, you will overcome what he says the autonomic conflict is. So when it comes to heart issues, I'm never going to tell somebody that they should. I'm only going to tell them how to do it if they want to. Mm. Start a little warmer. You can get a lot of the metabolic benefits. You don't need to be, just because someone sees you or me go in and it's all slushy water, Anything that gives them the gas reflex has activated their autonomic nervous system, is starting to improve their HRV, and the gas reflex for some people will happen at that 60 degree water level. Wow. Start easy. That's awesome. The other common um, limitation mentally for people is I have ray nods, so therefore I can't get cold on purpose. I have a theory that perhaps this is inducible, that, that with more practice, we can help to improve the circulatory system and therefore, and decrease the inflammation that may be tethered to Raynaud's. Um, what has been your experience? Because you guys have been worked with a lot of people. Yeah, I don't think it's just a theory. I think it's uh, an explanation for um, a phenomenon that a lot of people have experienced. But there are two forms of Raynaud's. Primary Raynaud's is a complex so psychophysiological reaction. It's an overreaction to the cold. We know that um, cold induces vasoconstriction. To defend your core temperature, your body will change the circulation of blood. It will shut off circulation to your fingers, to your toes, to your limbs. And that is so it reduces heat extraction through the most exposed part of your bodies. But in Renaud's, you're not even that cold and you get this extreme overreaction of vasoconstriction to the point where the fingers can turn white. That is partly psychological and partly physiological. That's called primary Raynaud's. Secondary Raynaud's is a vascular disorder that comes from some other underlying disease. So we're going to talk only about primary Raynaud's, this um, sort of psychophysio uh, overreaction to the cold. I know a woman who, she tells a story we have it on YouTube. And she talks about, it's New Year, she's in Arizona, and they're going to see the fireworks, and it's 60-something degrees, and she's all bundled up. But she experiences Renaud's attack, mm -hmm. and it takes hours for her to rewarm. Part of the attack is the anxiety. It's not cold now, or it's not too bad now, but you feel it coming on, and you don't know how bad it's going to be. And that kind of starts a feedback loop. The anxiety makes the response worse. The worsening response makes the anxiety worse, and it's very difficult to come back for. Well, when she told this story, she was up to her clavicles in 36-degree water. How is that even possible? Because there's something called exposure therapy. People have overcome their phobia of, let's say, spiders or snakes. First, you just watch somebody else, I don't know, reading a magazine article about spiders. It depends upon the level of the phobia. But exposure therapy titrates the exposure to the stress event in a way that is safe, teaches people physiological coping mechanisms like structuring their breath until they get to a level where, I'm going to exaggerate this, but where spiders are crawling all over them and there's no big deal. For primary Renaud's, exposure therapy has been one of the successful methods for overcoming Renaud's and is exactly the opposite of what people usually hear from their physician. They usually hear, oh, turn up the thermostat. Oh, mm -hmm. put on an extra sweater. Oh, I know it's, we call them Phoenix wimps. You know, it gets out to be 68 degrees in Phoenix and they're going to put on a hat and a winter coat and stuff. It's because they're no longer cold acclimated. You spend a couple of years in Phoenix, you're going to lose all your brown fat. Yeah. You're going to feel chilly. But I remember being in college in northern New York. I went to school in Potsdam, New York. And when it was like 45 degrees in March and there'd be snow every, we'd be playing Frisbee. And so like, hallelujah, winter is over. It's all contextual. So exposure therapy is one of the ways of resolving Renaud's. Otherwise, Renaud's would be another contraindication for ice baths. That's amazing. And how patient should one be with themselves? Um, a month, two months? I mean, it, it, or it's more psychological. It's a really good question. Yeah. Um, the woman I know did not want to get in the ice bath at all. Yeah. But we know each other really well. And her daughter was nine at the time. And her daughter's seeing me. Um, and, you know, I'm doing my thing. And we're taking pictures. And it's ice. And her daughter has cerebral palsy. 
and you wouldn't know it. She's yeah. been through hundreds, if not thousands of hours of therapy. And you'd have to know her really well to see that there's something a little off in her gait. Um, or maybe her posture isn't quite what you would expect. But to look at her, you're like, hey, what a happy, healthy kid. She's nine. And you know that nine-year-olds, they want to do you know whatever the grown-ups in their lives are doing. Yeah. So she's like, Mom, can I try? Mom's like, well, you know, you can put your feet in. She says, well, this feels really good on my feet. Because of the way her brain and her spinal cord works, she doesn't have the same proprioception, not the same sensation in her feet that we have. This feels really good. Can I go up to my waist, she asked. And mom says, well, you know, you, you can go, okay, you can try that. It feels really good, mom. Can I go up to my shoulders? And the deeper the child went, the more of a vicarious sort of anxiety reaction the mom had. Mm. But the impact of that was she couldn't let her kid do an ice bath and not try it herself. Yeah, and so yeah. at this point, she was super motivated to, um, to set a good example for her daughter, to do something that she felt proud of herself, despite her renauds. So we did it with the breathing. We did it with the mantra. This is what cold feels like. When the anxiety is coming up, it is every cell in your body trying to tell your brain to get out of there because we're going to die. It is your brain's job to correct every cell in your body, to say back to your cells, this is what cold feels like. This is not death. This is just cold. She breathed. She did like four minutes in the ice bath. Her uh -huh. daughter's very proud of her. Well, that was, I think, exceptional and immediate. That wasn't titrating the cold to do exposure therapy. It was um, the, the discipline of psychology overcoming the physiology. And when she got over that initial hurdle, I think she was done with Renaud's because wow. then she's able to ice bath. But we're not quite done with the story. Daughters have a way of growing up, as you know. Uh, so... From 9 to 13, cold exposure became this like huge thing. Ice baths are exploding. People are all over social media. You're getting like the likes on those videos that you uh, put up. And the daughter found out that Joe Rogan did 22 minutes in his Morozco because mm -hmm. Jocko Wilnick called him up and called him a wimp or something like that for only doing a minute and a half. And the daughter's like, 22 minutes? That's nothing. So she came over to my place again with mom and she said, I want to do an ice bath. Mom's like, okay, that's okay. Now I was in my living room. Mom and daughter are out on the balcony and I'm getting the text messages from mom. Mom says, she's been in there eight minutes and um, I'm a little worried. Oh no, that's no problem. She's been in there 12 minutes and it seems like a long time. Oh no, no, that's no problem. She's says that she wants to beat joe rogan and that's 22 minutes i'm a little worried oh no that's no problem i get a text message she's been in there half an hour get her out <laughs> you know? it takes a long time for hypothermia like an hour and a half to really drop your core body temperature mm. by the two and a half degrees thereabouts that would be considered hypothermia but at half an hour i think she proved her point yeah she got out she could barely walk like mm, uh stiff and yeah when i did 22 minutes i didn't have any motor control either and i don't have a sauna so now the problem is what do we do to rewarm and mom is very worried put her in the car it's phoenix mm -hmm. you crank up the heat you leave the windows up i call it a car sauna and as long as you're not driving mm -hmm. You can get, in Phoenix, you can get up to 165 degrees. You don't need a sauna. You just need some sunshine in a parking lot. Uh, she, we were warmed. She was great. She was very proud of herself. Wow. She still does. She doesn't feel the need to, to do, do right. One of the things I like about what you've shown people is you can microdose. That psychological hurdle, shoot the anxiety when you're just thinking about getting the ice bath, mm -hmm. is often worse than the being in the ice bath. The first 15 seconds are where you get that autonomic response, you get that fight or flight, you don't need to set any records. Right. 
two minutes is more than enough. But if all you got today is 45 seconds, give it a shot. I think it's fine. I mean, I just look at it. The consistency for me is more important than the the total duration. Um, I mean, just like with exercise, you know, some people run one marathon a year. They train for Boston or New York or Chicago, whatever. uh, Then they don't run for the rest of the year. And they're most likely going to regain the weight they lost in training and all that. So for me, it's that consistency because of the... Uh, maybe it's the cold shock proteins or the brown adipose tissue activation. But, you know, one thing that you've been talking a lot about is the hormonal shifts, uh, particularly testosterone increases, which, you know, I've heard that anecdotally over the years when people were converting their chest freezers and stuff like that, you know, when that was going on maybe four or five years ago. Um, uh, from a lot of my healthcare practitioner friends, they noticed that they have more vitality, more vigor, um, better functioning. It in the feels bedroom. great. So let's dive into that. And, and what you notice with your own testosterone and the PSA story that you shared with me offline, I think that is pretty empowering because we're seeing, as, as we were talking about offline, the testosterone levels now of a 20-year-old male or a 35-year-old male is what historically with, in their predecessor comparisons is now what like 50-year-old men uh, would normally have. Where you're seeing that in 20 and, and 30-year-olds. So um, how do you think it's increasing testosterone? This was a, an accident um, for me. I was 51 or 52 at the time. And we, Arizona had just changed the law. You could order your own labs. Mm. Well, I'm getting kind of curious about things. And so I ordered the male health blood panel, whatever the heck is in there, you know, mm. the, all the cholesterol and you got to fast before you have the blood drawn. And they take PSA, which is prostate specific antigen. They measure your free and total testosterone. And I got all of that done. My PSA came back like 7.8. In retrospect, I probably shouldn't have worried about it, but they flagged it on the report like that's elevated. Now, you're supposed to take a lab report like that and you're supposed to go to a doctor and say, doctor, we should do a prostate exam, don't you think? And doctor, what do you think? But as soon as you make contact with the allopathic medicine industry, they're worse than car salesmen. They're never going to let you go. They're like, well, yes, we should do the prostate exam. And have you had any trouble urinating? Like, have you been incontinent? Have you had an interruption of flow? And all of a sudden, these, all these ideas are going through my head. Like, I don't know how I pee. Mm. Like, is this normal or is this not normal? And I said, before I talk to any doctor, I'm going to talk to some other guys. Guys don't talk anywhere near enough because people that I thought, men in my life, some younger, some older, who have I've known for years, they'd say, well, yeah, I had my prostate out. Why didn't you tell me? You know, like, when did this happen? Well, it was 18 months ago. But I, you, we yeah. were together. Like, you never mentioned it. Well, you know, it's not the kind of thing. I talked to older guys. I said, well, I had a biopsy, and I decided not to have it out. They all sounded like miserable experiences. So in my anxiety and my determination to avoid allopathic medicine, I said, prostate cancer is typically very slow, and a PSA is an unreliable indication of anything. I'm going to do some keto. I'm going to cycle in and out. I'm going to double down on the ice baths. I'm going to see what happens in six months. Mm -hmm. Six months later, I do another panel. My PSA is down to 0.8, which is, I mean, at my age, anything under than four is considered fine. At least that's what they put on the report. But I was really happy with 0.8. My testosterone was 1180. This is total T, nanograms per deciliter. What the hell happened? Mm-hmm. Because that came back with a big red triangular exclamation mark, like out of range. This is too high for your age. So I had to do some more research. Too far high for my age, nonsense. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be normal because normal is these graphs that you were just talking about. We've seen them in the journal articles where the line just keeps going down, 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 down. Out of range, but in a good way. Mm-hmm. So I had to go to the library. This is what I do. I don't literally go to the library. I go to scholar.google and found a study in 1991. This was out of Japan. They took young men and they put them, it wasn't even an ice bath. They used the cold presser test up to their elbow in ice water. So it's called cold stimulation. And then they put them on an exercise bike. Testosterone, luteinizing hormone went way up through the roof. When they did it the other way, First exercise, then do the cold stim, which is almost always the way that people do it. Testosterone and luteinizing hormone went down. Mm. The order for men really matters. Well, I wasn't working out. I wasn't doing ice baths because I wanted to get jacked or because I wanted to recover from all the running that I, and I don't run at all. I was doing the ice baths because 
I wanted to heal my metabolism. I wanted to see if it could shrink my prostate. When I got out of the ice bath, I was cold, so I would rewarm. It's either push-ups or jumping jacks or my steel mace, or I would go on a walk. Not a lot of exercise. It was just supposed to warm me up. The Japanese study, they did 20 minutes on the circular bike. That was stationary bicycle. That was it. Wow. They're not even heavy lifting or anything. And that's how they got their boost. I'm like, well, that's amazing. That was a 1991 study. I wrote an article about what happened to me. Um, my ice bath partner, Jason, he said, well, I got to try this. He took his testosterone from 600 up to 940, doing the same thing. Well, now we're up to N equals 2. Since then, the Italian rugby team, like these European football teams, soccer, if you're in the United States, you know, all these, this work on male athletes has been really curious about testosterone. How do we maximize their anabolic gains? And Hugh Ruman is right about this. Do not ice bath for recovery if what you're trying to do is build muscle mass. If, I don't know, you're in the Tour de France and you just finished a leg and mm. you want to bring yourself back up to performance level right away, the ice bath can help you with that. But it will not help you with the anabolic gains. Hugh Ruman says, wait four or five hours, which sounds like really good advice. Yeah. But if what you're going for is to correct your testosterone level, I'm now 57. I just remeasured. I was like 1100, 1040, something like this. It's still over a thousand, which many people consider exceptional. And I'm thinking, I don't feel exceptional. Mm -hmm. I'm a 57 year old fat guy. Like it seems achievable, but it takes time. When you're going to do this for anabolic gains, Use exercise to recover from the cold, not the other way around. The studies that I've seen that have come out since 1991 reinforce this pattern in men that the cold before, it's called pre-cooling. Craig Heller is a scientist at Stanford who studied pre-cooling for performance enhancement. Peak muscle power goes way up. Endurance goes way up because the pre-cooling effect protects the mitochondria. And of course, your testosterone response goes way up. This is what Joe Rogan was talking about in December with David Goggins. Mm -hmm. I think he said, there's this tremendous benefit for doing your ice bath before your exercise. The only problem is he says it's really hard. It really sucks because it's winter. What Joe say, you know, 40 degrees where he lives in Texas and he's in his underwear and nobody wants to get into the cold when it's gray yeah. and chilly. But when you pre-cool your workout, your testosterone will boost. Women, it's different. There's only been one study. And again, it was the cold presser test. Mm -hmm. It was undergraduate women. Uh, so early 20s, they were measuring saliva. And they wanted to measure a lot of the hormones. But testosterone was one of the ones that they grabbed. And this was not a testosterone study. What they found was, in women, cold stimulation raises their saliva testosterone they did not find the same effect for men now why would this be so what it suggests is women don't even have to exercise just get a little bit of cold well when you think about in women testosterone is made in the ovaries those are inside the body in men testosterone is made in the testes those are outside the body why wouldn't we respond differently to cold exposure when our anatomy is so different mm -hmm. But what we don't have is reliable studies on female athletes, just like the analog on the rugby players or whatever, that says this is what's going to happen if you do whole body followed up by exercise. We have no data on menopausal women for where testosterone is a really important um, sex hormone. As a matter of fact, testosterone is the dominant sex hormone in women, just like it is in men. They have more testosterone in their body than they have estrogen. Not as much as men do. Mm -hmm. But testosterone is an important sex hormone at any age in an adult, in any woman's life. When it comes to menopausal women who are experiencing a testosterone deficiency, there are no FDA approved treatments for menopausal women. You have to tell a clinician wants to treat a menopausal woman. She's got to take TRT that is designed for a man and somehow adapt it to a woman. So if we could get more data on older women and testosterone so they could produce this endogenously, this would, for some women, this would feel like a miracle. A game changer for yeah. sex life, bone mineral density, muscle mass. They're not following me on Instagram. It's the jocks who are following me on Instagram yeah. saying, how do I get my T levels up? But I think there's a real medical need for um, more studies on older people. 
That's amazing. So the mechanism here is more pre-exercise cold and that that causes the post-exercise increase in the testosterone. Yep. That's super fascinating. I, the you know I used to do that uh, pre-covid there was a powerlifting class at 7:30 in the morning and I would get in the plunge and then go um, but then I remember I didn't warm up it was like a, a bench day. I didn't warm up my and I did something to my tricep and I just mentally was like okay I'm going to I can't do that anymore. But now I, I'm going to start redoing that cuz I wasn't I didn't make the association between the pre-exercise cold and then the post-exercise increases, but that does make a lot of sense. There is a lot of like intra-workout cooling mechanisms that people are developing to help increase muscular power and, and endurance. So if you could go, go into it cooler, you could tolerate more power and more work. And so I think that's a, a fascinating mechanism. Just, you know, warm up a little bit better. And I think you're good. One of the cool things about social media is um, I get to hear from a lot of people. We get into a conversation. So guys ask me, well, do you have to start exercising right away? I don't know, uh, yeah. what's working for you? And they say, well, I'll do my ice bath. Then it takes me 25 minutes to go to the gym. And I still feel cold when I go to the gym. Do you think I'm getting benefits? I'm like, well, have you measured your tea? Mm -hmm. And they're telling me, yes, when you, you haven't quite warmed up all the way. Mm -hmm. And then you start your workout. We're still seeing some beneficial effect. It doesn't have to be right away. But then guys are asking me, but couldn't I injure myself? My muscles feel tight, you know? And um, would that be a good thing for my work? I don't know. I'm not a physiologist or mm. a kinesiologist. I'm an engineer. But it doesn't have to be a lot of exercise. Yeah. This is where a warm-up routine might be really helpful. For me, it could be a walk. I heard from one guy in Massachusetts. He's four or five years older than me. He was on TRT. Yeah. He'd read the articles. He said... I don't want to be on TRT my whole life. I want to try this instead. Yeah. So he went down to a pond by his house and he would do his cold exposure in the pond. And then he would walk back. And this is just like soccer mom power. Mm. Walk. We have no pride when we get to 61 and we're trying to like improve our T. He sent me his before after test results. He went from 550 when he was on TRT, testosterone mm. replacement therapy, to over 1200 and he ditched the TRT. Wow. And he's in his 60s. That's it doesn't, yeah, I thought so too. It doesn't take a lot of exercise. Mm -hmm. A walk can do it. The Japanese guys were on the stationary bike. So if you're worried about injury because you want to pre-cool your power lifting, put an interval in there where you're just doing body weight stuff. Um, you could be doing, uh, I don't know, some burpees, uh, or maybe you could walk to your gym and this would get you the exercise you need for the testosterone you're looking for. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I've been naturally doing uh, is my daughter, we bike to school. So cold plunge and bike to school. And yeah, I feel I'll be 41 in August. And like, I feel like the most vital that I've been my whole life. So uh, very fascinating. I think that's a that could impact the the lives of a lot of men, which is really fascinating. Um, you mentioned brown fat earlier, the adaptation there. Uh, we were talking about the obesity crisis. We see it everywhere in airports, grocery stores, you know, amusement parks, uh, unfortunately, obese children. Um, the idea that our brown adipose tissue, it, it, it might be common that brown adipose tissue goes into a nadir as you get to be an adult, but it's not normal. We should be able to that's right. tolerate. So the, do you think that's up there with, you know, in addition to the Hans Selye resilience principle being yeah. primary, that we're inducing this, this dormant uh, fat tissue and that has these metabolic health benefits? Brown fat is an essential organ. Um, you know, it, I want to compare it to a kidney or to the liver. And people understand that those are essential organs. But the thing is, if you lose your brown fat, it doesn't catch up with you all at once, like the other organs that we're familiar with. Babies have about 30% of their body weight is brown fat. Because their muscles are so underdeveloped, they can't shiver to keep warm. So they use non-shivering cold thermogenesis, and that's all brown fat. Babies know how to stay cold. The parents are anxious. The parents are like, oh my gosh, we gotta have a hat and we gotta swaddle them up and stuff like, but babies are well protected. Then as we grow, it's not that our brown fat necessarily diminishes, but the rest of our body is growing up so much. So we hear that expression, you grow out of your baby fat. The muscles get bigger. They can handle more of the shivering thermogenesis. Without regular cold exposure, you really will lose all your brown fat. There's a study by the age of 40, 95% of the people in the United States have zero detectable brown fat. Wow. 
So what does that mean when I say it's an essential organ? Metabolic disorders are associated with a lack of brown fat because brown fat does not just keep you warm in the cold. It is also a secretory organ. That is, it makes hormones. It makes more thyroid stimulating hormone than any other thing in your body will. Ben Bickman is really good on this one and he did a post on it recently. Your thyroid and your brown fat, they work together. If your brown fat is diminished to the point because you live in Florida or you live in Phoenix to the point where you just don't have any, your thyroid has nothing to modulate its activity. So now hyper or hypothyroidism is so much more common in people with no brown fat because they're not getting the thyroid stimulating. Thyroid talks to the brown fat. Brown fat talks back to the thyroid. When you are experiencing a thyroid disorder, if your physician is not asking you about cold exposure then you're missing a potential remedy that will not require a lifetime of prescription medicine. Add some cold back into your life mm-hmm. and you will, it's called beijing your white fat. You will recruit new brown fat into your body. That brown fat, it will produce neuroprotective hormones for your brain. It will produce thyroid stimulating hormone and it will modulate your metabolism to bring it back in order. Brown fat has so many benefits beyond just cold acclimation that I think I've just scratched the surface of it. It's amazing. I mean, I like to follow the research trends and and all that. And it seems that uh, pharmaceutical companies and tech companies are trying to make a memetic or some sort of uh, messenger that would normally be released from the brown fat that you would take exogenously. But uh, I think the best way to um, circumvent using drugs is just to induce it naturally by getting cold. And Jack Cruz has a uh, saying, he's so difficult to listen to sometimes, but this is the one that sticks in my mind. If your body can make it, you don't need to take it. Mm, now it. you might need to give your body the right stimulus, the right nutrition, the right ingredients that they need to make the thing. But um, he's got kind of a good point. Why are the pharmaceuticals trying to put in a pill what your body can make if you just give it a little cold exposure and activate your brown fat? I would much rather a cold shower Mm -hmm. can do it. Uh, A walk outdoors in a t-shirt on a winter day can do it. It doesn't have to be a lot of cold. But see, people ask me, um, but wait a second, you know, my ancestors are equatorial. Uh, You know, it might be fine for you, Tom, your people come from the North Sea or wherever and they got cold. But if you're um, one of the like East Africans or you're from Nigeria or you're from one of these warmer climates, why should you have to get cold? And it's a great question that challenges the intuition. And then I realized, where does Wim Hof take his trainees? Up Mount Kilimanjaro. Where is Mount Kilimanjaro? It's on the equator, for goodness sakes. Turns out there are four active glaciers in East Africa where the oldest Homo sapien fossils have been found. So if you buy this idea that, that human beings emerged in East Africa and then they had to survive the Ice Age, these bottlenecks where the whole human population was down to like 10,000 people, according to what I'm reading in the archaeological records. Those 10,000 people were living between the the glacier and the cold ocean. They bathed in the streams. They foraged in the streams. They hunted in the streams. They gave birth in the streams, and those streams were cold. Mm -hmm. Everyone's body is evolutionarily designed to expect cold exposure, just like it's designed to expect exercise, just like it's designed to expect certain nutrition. If you don't get cold, you're not giving your body what your ancestors got, what you're designed to expect, and you will experience disorders of metabolism as a result. They sneak up on you. Like 30, you're feeling great. 35, you're like, oh, I don't know, I don't have the energy that I used to have. And by 55, your doctor's trying to get you on all these prescription medicines and telling you that you have a progressive degenerative disease that is going to last you the rest of your life, when the fact is you have a thermostat problem. Yeah. I mean, this is true. And I remember there was an article in 2010 in the Journal of Obesity finding a correlation. This is just like a 
an observation that people who live in thermal neutral environments generally have a higher rate of adiposity, more overweightness. And part of that could be this lack of induction of the thermal stress that causes people to then gain uh, body fat. So I, I think the evidence there, uh, epidemiologic evidence is there and all that. And I was unaware of that archaeological data. That's That really adds a nice perspective. It does. It tells yeah. a good story. Uh, and I'm not drawing a graph with an R squared of, you know, 0.99 or yeah. something through the, but it's an, a story that informs our intuition and some of the best hypotheses comes out of these, uh, stories. And it's also worth cautioning people. One thing that cold exposure has not done for me is help me lose weight. Mm. Like uh, I used to be 250 pounds okay. and I lost weight not by doing, I did up my exercise, but not by doing cold, but by changing my diet, doing a little more keto, mostly go, skipping meals. So yeah. intermittent fasting. I've never met somebody that says, and then I started doing cold exposure and you know, the before, after, and look at me, I'm jacked. Mm -hmm. um, cold exposure is great for the metabolism and it does burn a lot of fat. It uses up a lot of calories while you're in it. But when you go to bed, you sleep great. And why do you sleep great? Because your body takes your core, your resting temperature down. And it can be as much as like a degree and a half Fahrenheit. These are called compensatory metabolic mechanisms. Your body knows you're in this like this fat deficit. It could be a caloric deficit, but in this energy deficit. And your body's like, eh, we're going to make that up. There's two, I'm going to oversimplify, but there's two categories of fat to think about. One of them is subcutaneous fat. I got plenty of it. The other is visceral fat or the pot belly fat. The difference between subcutaneous fat and visceral fat is that visceral fat will kill you and subcutaneous fat can be benign. And I think you've published on this before. You say just because you're overweight doesn't necessarily mean that you're metabolically healthy. Recently, your messaging has been more on point with, look, get your body composition in order. Um, but you can be metabolically healthy with more subcutaneous fat than sure. is ideal. It is the visceral fat that really does the damage. Cold exposure will remodel your fat. It will change visceral fat into subcutaneous. It will not help you lose weight because it induces some kind of caloric deficit. And then the really scary thing is when you start doing ice baths and you go to the gym and use the in-body scanner or one of these, you know, impedance devices and it sends a current through your arms and your feet to measure your body composition, you will notice a big jump in your body fat composition and a loss of lean mass. And then you will write me an email and say, what the heck is going on? Because I feel great. I look great. How could I possibly put on four pounds of fat in the last two weeks? And the answer is the electrical impedance meter is not calibrated for brown fat. When you mm -hmm. add brown fat around your clavicles and your shoulder blades, you are messing with the body fat scanner. Wow. Relax. Uh, they, they're calibrating it for the people, the 95% of people who have no detectable brown fat left. So you'll see an adjustment. Don't worry about the absolute numbers anymore. You can pay attention to the direction. But I've heard from a number of people, including myself, who see a hop. When they recruit brown fat, they become cold acclimated and their body scanner results get messed up. That is so interesting. I've never heard that before. That makes a lot of sense, though. It does. I don't have any data on DEXA scans or more sophisticated. And I really want some. I uh, just haven't gotten around to getting it. That's cool. I mean, it seems like we're at the precipice of, of a whole new wave of science when it comes to understanding how uh, this physiology works. I remember some of the early studies, you know, you mentioned Japan, there was some in Quebec where they put vests on people. But yeah. now it's like this cold swimming, cold immersions is really kind of taken off, which is fascinating. But so let's, let's kind of wrap up with best practices. You know, I am of the belief, look at the circadian rhythm changes in temperature that the morning seems like a good time. That's when the body's coolest to help entrain that. However, I like to your point that you just mentioned, um, maybe a cold plunge before bed uh, is helpful for sleep. So what what do you what have you heard from people in your own experience, you know, internally with Morosco Forge is best for uh, just feeling good, reducing uh, inflammatory joint issues, uh, all that? What's the any time is better than no time. Uh, sure. The difference between zero and a little bit is tremendous. It's just like exercise. Um, and after that, it seems like personal preferences are a big deal. For me, I got my Morosco on the east side of my apartment. Uh, you know, I live up in this high rise and it's on the balcony. So I have this tiny little ice bath. 
but that's where the sun comes up. Mm. And I want to get the sun in my eyes because I, I don't know, I follow Cruz or Huberman, whoever tells me that's a really good thing for me. I like the dawn. I like starting my day with something hard and I feel this sense of accomplishment. But I have a friend, um, Brian Call lives in Hood River, Oregon. And, you know, he came to visit me and he went in nine o'clock at night. And I said, how can you possibly sleep after? Because I feel so activated after the ice bath. It would take me hours to get to sleep. He goes, I sleep like a baby. Mm. You know, he had a aura ring and uh, he gets feedback on his sleep for him. Evening works a little better. Mm. And I suppose people have different, they talk about night owls. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. Um, however, two to four minutes, that's yeah. all I do. Uh, I want to feel the anxiety. I want to feel the fight or flight. I'm not trying to beat Jocko or Joe Rogan or set any records. And I do get bored mm-hmm. after I structure my breathing I do some counter exercise or counting exercises in my head. Um, I'll check in with different parts of my body and then it'll be three minutes. And I'm like, don't I have a journal article to write? You know, mm-hmm. and the, the yeah. whole list of things, uh, so every day, two to four minutes, other people, they want to go longer. They'll do four or five. Mm. My girlfriend feels like if she's not doing four minutes, you know, then what did she even bother? Mm. She times it with a song. She'll pick one, she'll play it, and she's not getting out until the song is done. Mm. So I'm not recommending, you know, Purple Rain or anything, mm. um, but play a pop song if uh, that's how you want to time it. The study out of Denmark that uh, Susanna Soberg did, she took a look at the, you know, these Danes, they go in the fjord and they do winter swimming and stuff. They reported to her an average of 11 minutes a week. We don't really know what the minimum effective dose is. All we know is that if you're getting 11 minutes a week, that was enough to keep the brown fat working in this study. So it could be you do two ice baths, each one a week, each one five minutes. Maybe that's good. I do the more frequently and a little shorter. Mm -hmm. Me too. But I do think that is nice for people that maybe... Um, don't have the availability or, or whatever, or don't want to do it every day. But that, that I was surprised by that, the minimum effective dose of yeah, 11 minutes throughout the week. That's, and there was just another study, one five minute session change. They looked at uh, FM, fMRI uh, changes within the brain and emotional regulation. So it's like, wow, you don't need to do the 20 minute thing. So I, I think that's, I agree. that's really cool. I saw that um, you were summarizing that study came out in January Everything in psychology is about subjective self-report. Oh, how do you feel? I feel Mm. sad. I feel depressed. There are no objective signs. And Chris Palmer's book, Brain Energy, is really good on this, where he says, signs are third-party verifiable objective measures. Symptoms are subjective self-reports. And psychology relies almost exclusively on symptoms. But metabolism, you can use signs. So this January paper with the fMRI, they asked people, how do you feel after cold experiment? Oh, I feel great. But then they put the fMRI to see if the activity in their brain corresponded to the feelings that they were reporting. Sure enough, it did. Mm-hmm. So here's an unpublished bit of uh, data that Joe DeTore, uh showed me, and he says it's okay for me to share. He's using an EEG, and the EEG that he's using, very high-resolution research equipment, you have to remain perfectly still to get good, steady results. And he's got to accumulate data over something like a minimum of three minutes. So he puts the EEG on when they're warm and dry. Then they get in the Morosco and they're cold and wet. But he needs experienced subjects. So, of course, he starts with himself. He says, Tom, my EEG lit up. Mm. The phase lag, which is a measure of how long it takes for one part of the brain to communicate with another, goes way down. And his coherence, which is the different sections of the brain that are communicating with one, goes way up. And the graphical depiction of the data is extraordinary. He hasn't published this because he's got two people who are practiced enough to be that still. But I'm going to see him soon and we're going to talk about how can we get lower res data. If the signal is so strong, we ought to be able to do it even if it's a lower res. Here's why he cares. He was in a car wreck that injured his brain. And he retooled his scientific career. He spent like 28 years as a Navy diver. Then he got his doctorate. Now he's a scientist. He retooled his scientific career around healing traumatic brain injury. 
hyperbaric and cold exposure is what he's using now. He says, if I can get this kind of activity in the ice bath where my brain is talking and it's doing it so fast, I wonder if it will accelerate the recovery uh, from my traumatic brain injury. We don't know. So the question, I mean, we're talking about protocols. Do you want to build tea? Do you want to uh, remodel your fat? Are you working on cognitive benefits? And here's a new one that I got. This is like two days ago. I got a message from an opera singer who says that he's using the ice bath to help him memorize his opera. And it's not just the lyrics. He goes, it's the translation and it's the blocking and it's, every, it's the direction that he's got to get. He goes through his practice session. And then he does like three minutes in his freezer. And he goes, my memory is so much better. It's shortened the sessions that I need to memorize the whole performance. Well, how does this happen? He goes, well, I read something about trauma and memory. He goes, I remember everything that happened to me the day I was in a car wreck in college. But I remember everything that happened before the car wreck. I remember everything that happened before I found out about 9-11. So I had to go look it up. There is something. This goes back to Seely and trauma. We are hardwired to consolidate short-term memory into vivid long-term memory when we experience emotional arousal. It doesn't have to be trauma. It could be surprise, but it could be anything exciting. I remember my first kiss, and I remember what it was like right before my first kiss because that level of emotional arousal causes our brain to write everything from short-term into long-term. Why? Because you need to know evolutionarily you're like okay what happened right before the bear attack like what happened right before the traumatic what happened right before we found the blueberries or whatever it was so the protocols and i'll write about this in my book when i finish it the protocols are what are you working on if it's going to be tea then the protocol is do two minutes in the ice bath do some light exercise. Mm. If it's going to be you're studying and you'd rather use cold exposure than Ritalin, then you're going to have your study session and then do your two minutes in the ice bath. Mm. It is amazingly flexible. That is so awesome. And then what about for the trauma? Is there any different in the protocol there for that? Yeah, uh, and I'm glad you brought it up because one of the questions I get a lot is to shiver or not to shiver. And if you're, you know, there's a lot on weight loss. Huberman talks about this and um, you really want to drive the energy expenditure and uh, I don't buy it. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to debate it. I don't want to contradict him because if it's working for people, uh, keep working. The I don't shiver so much in the ice bath for thermogenesis. Mm -hmm. I shiver when I'm anxious about something. If I'm... I don't know, I'm having a fight with my girlfriend or I'm worried about sales at Morosco or the department chair at ASU is coming down on me for something that I did wrong in some form that I filled out, which is every other week, by the way. Wow. Then I'll get in the ice bath and the shivering can start like right away. Mm. And it's not shivering for thermogenesis. It's shivering for nervous system release. This is something else different to work on in the ice bath. Sometimes I'll get reports from people who say, I don't know what happened, but I got in this morning and I started crying and I don't know why. Mm. Well, there's something going on in your life. It can bring on a lot of feelings and it is okay. In psychology, there's a term called trembling. Trembling and shivering, I don't know how to mm. distinguish these, but one of them is post-operative. So after brain surgery, the patient, will begin trembling when they come out of anesthesia. And they used to think it was because they go into a hypothermic state. It's not. It's because the brain has been traumatized and their nervous system is releasing the trauma via trembling. Peter Levine writes about this quite a bit. Um, An Unspoken Voice is a good book and Waking the Tiger. And in one of these books, he talks about when he was hit by a car, he did not lose consciousness, but he's on the pavement and he's immobilized. PTSD is unresolved stress. Not all stress is trauma. Trauma is when the stress doesn't have a release or a resolution. And immobilizing the patient is one of the reasons that the dentist chair is so difficult because you have to stay still like you're strapped down while they're drilling your teeth. And it can traumatize a child because they ha the stress has nowhere to go. So Levine He's been hit by the car and he begins to tremble. An off-duty paramedic finds him and wants to stop the trembling and reveals, like, just leave me alone. Mm -hmm. Because he knows that the trembling will release the stress from his nervous system and he will not suffer 
PTSD. Sure enough, his heart rate came out came down his blood pressure stabilized while he was in the ambulance and he had confidence that he wasn't going to be traumatized by the event even though it was stressful when i get into the ice bath and i'm riddled with my anxieties i will sometimes bring the shiver on just to let those anxieties go and i would encourage other people to try that as well yeah that is so amazing I actually had a, a stressful uh day last tuesday when i was traveling in idaho and I didn't know how, <clears throat> I didn't have my Morosco. I wasn't here. And so I went in the, they had a lot of rain and glacier melt and all that. So I went in the river and just, and I, I started to shiver really quickly. I saw quickly. that post. It's, you posted it, right? Yeah. yeah. But I, I was like, I need to release. I, I don't have access to a gym. I'm out in the woods. So I'm like, what can I do? Did some breath work, jumped in and I felt so much better afterwards. But yeah, I, I was like shivering right away, but I wasn't aware of all the, the backstory that you just mentioned yeah. there. So I think, you know, another tool that I do, if I want to induce the shivers, I'll start moving my legs in the Morosco, you know, yeah. just like that thermal layer that's on the skin and just that gets you colder faster. I, I guess that would be more of a tactic that's advanced for people. But there uh, is a study that shows people can suppress their shivering response. Shivering gives you great biofeedback. Mm -hmm. And so you can put yourself in one state of mind that we either postpone cold thermogen, non shivering uh, people who are not cold acclimated in this study. So they, they're not using non shivering cold thermogenesis because they have a lot of brown fat, but they can postpone their muscle shivering just using their mind and the more practice they get, the better they are at it. Mm -hmm. And I can relate because I can bring the shivering on or I can delay the yeah. suppress the shivering with my mind. And I like kind of playing tricks like that, but mostly I'll get an email and uh, I was like, I got to forge this one out. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Yeah. yeah. That's so awesome. Right. To be able to have these, it's a lot better than alcohol or uh, smoking or drugs. I, mean. I got a DM from a woman the other day, um, and I was really nervous about this one because she contacted me a month ago, and her husband suffers PTSD. She was really worried he was using alcohol to numb his feelings. Some people uh, think alcohol is the problem, but a lot of people turn to it looking for a solution. Mm -hmm. And that was, seemed to me like that was the case. She wanted to encourage him to use cold exposure. And I was like, look, it's got to be of his own volition, especially mm. if this is a PTSD situation. She promised me that she wasn't going to convert, uh, coerce him or shame him or bully him into doing it. So I got this DM. I was like, uh-oh. She said he's been doing it for a month. They do it together. He's been alcohol three for three weeks. Wow. He's sleeping great. And this is helping him manage all the emotions that he used to try and avoid by numbing himself. She, you know, couldn't thank me enough for putting this knowledge out there. And I'm thinking he's just at the beginning. And I'm so happy that they're doing it together. That's cool. Because when I do it with my girlfriend, it brings us closer. It brings up the dopamine. It brings up, you know, for me, the testosterone. And now I know that it's bringing up for her too, which is great because that's the lust hormone. It brings up the oxytocin and the vasopressin that create a bonding experience. It's a wonderful thing for a couple to do. That's amazing. I love that. Um, okay, so let's wrap up with what is the difference, the main difference. There's a lot of products out there for folks. Uh, I'm biased. I own the Morosco Forge. I really like it. The filtration, uh, it actually makes ice, which is great. Um, there's all sorts of other products out there. How, how would you position and what are the advantages for people? There are three things that are important when you're going to spend a lot of money on an ice bath. Um, the first thing is temperature. Now, and that's not the most important, but it's the first thing because it's an ice bath. Does it make ice? If what you're working on is metabolism, you don't need ice. I need ice because I'm working on scaring myself. And if I don't see chunks of ice, then I know it's not cold enough to scare me. So the first thing is temperature. The second thing is, is it grounded when you're in Idaho and you're getting in the natural stream, you're not just getting the benefit of the temperature or the hydrotherapy, you're getting grounding therapy. You know that um, you take your shoes off, you walk around in the grass, 20, 25 minutes later, you're going to discharge all that static electricity in your body and you're going to be electrically connected to the earth. There are a lot of great benefits of that. It changes what's called zeta potential in your blood cells. It changes the tendency of your blood cells to coagulate. Mm -hmm. So it can reduce the risk of stroke or other uh, medical incidents that are associated with blood clots, heart attack, deep vein thrombosis. Grounding is great for your circulatory system. It's also great for your psychology. Mm -hmm. 
However, you don't get it in your bathtub. When your bathtub's made of acrylic, you don't get it in a cold shower. When you've like inflated an ice bath or you bought a Rubbermaid or, you know, whatever it is, none of these things are grounded. It must be a metal tub to be grounded. And not only must it be metal, it must be electrically connected to the earth. Now the water, which is the fastest, best way to get grounded, like the ocean is number one. When the tub is grounded, now you're stacking your benefits. You're getting the grounding benefit that your body is expecting when you're doing the ice bath. The third thing is water treatment. What kind of filtration and disinfection system does it have? Morosco uses ozone, and it does that because when I was in grad school for environmental engineering, I was surrounded by, I wasn't working on ozone, but it seemed like all my lab mates were. The Europeans are way ahead of us on ozone in water treatment. It is the most powerful disinfectant, more powerful than chlorine. And the big advantage is it doesn't create chlorinated byproducts. So it's great Mm -hmm. for water treatment. The problem with ozone is it doesn't work at high temperatures. The O3 molecule is so unstable that it'll just collapse into O2 before it really gets to do the work. Most ozone gen units for hot tubs are useless. I tested six of them before I selected one for the forge, and they didn't do a dang thing. However, the one that we use, uh, Dell Ozone, it's on our website, um, it works really well. And at cold temperatures, the ozone is perfect. So if you're thinking about these three things, temperature, how cold does it get? Is it getting as cold as I want? Uh, Do I want the grounding benefit? Or do I have other ways to get grounded? And then water disinfection. If you're buying from a company that says, and you only need to change the water every other day, it's because their filtration sucks. If you're buying an ice barrel, which is a less expensive way to, and it's, you know, it's formed pretty well, um, and a lot of people enjoy that, you're going to have to swap out your water. Mm. The Morosco is going to keep that water clean for you. People say, how often do I have to change it? And I say, the same frequency that you got to change the water in your pool, which is never, you just top it off mm. because we've got the same equipment that your pool uses cleaning out your water. That's amazing. And you like to put uh, a lot of minerals in there, like magnesium do. and so forth. Yeah. I was reading a lot about Epsom salt. Um, now, first, I put Epsom salt, which is magnesium sulfate, in because the ice was so dang hard. I would have to get, you see these videos, I get my steel mace out and mm. I'm breaking it up. The Epsom salt softens the ice. And then I'm reading the journal articles and half of them say there's no such thing as transdermal magnesium absorption. They say that the pores are too small or they say, which isn't true, by the way, the pores are plenty big enough for a magnesium ion to diffuse through them. Or they say, well, studies show that you go into the Epsom bath and then we draw your blood and we don't see any boost in magnesium. So there must be no magnesium transdermal benefit. And then I was talking with my friend Brian Call and he says, Tom, only 1% of the magnesium in your body is stored in your blood. Mm. What? He goes, yeah, most of it's in your bones, some of it's in your muscles, but magnesium doesn't hang out in your blood. That's where iron goes, you know? Um, No, magnesium... Mostly, it's got other things to do. It's similar to calcium, and it plays a role in the body that is complementary to calcium. So you store it in your bones, and when you need it, it will be released from your bones. I'm like, this is why these blood tests don't show any magnesium benefits. So I'll go back to the library. They put people in an Epsom salt bath, and then they measured magnesium in the urine, and it went way up. Mm. Of course you're getting a magnesium. And it wasn't even a cold bath. So... I put eight pounds of Epsom salt. I've experimented with as high as 18, mm-hmm. as low as four, and, you know, kind of settled in at eight pounds magnesium sulfate, not chloride. Keep the chloride out of your ice bath. It may interact with the ozone in ways that you don't want. Mm-hmm. It may interact with the tub in ways that promote corrosion, but sulfate is fine. And then just because I'm crazy, I added some potassium sulfate. I added some zinc sulfate. Mm-hmm. If you have a stainless tub, which you don't, by the way, Mm. you can add copper, but don't put any copper. It will interact with the zinc lining and it will strip the galvanizing off of it. And then you call me up and you say, what am I going to do? But yeah, I put in Epsom salt. I put in some potassium sulfate. I put in um, some zinc sulfate. And then I don't shower afterwards. Um, 
Mm. Yeah, don't tell my girlfriend. Uh, mm. She already knows. Uh, but the point is I want the salt on my body so that when I go out into the Phoenix heat and I begin to sweat and my pores open up, I can still get some of that transdermal benefit. I have no way of measuring this. Yeah. But when I was a kid, I used to love the feeling, you know, you're at the beach all day and then you're all salty. And that's the way I feel. So it has very warm, effective thoughts for me. Totally. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, and plus it keeps the eyes soft and not these big chunks. And so, yeah, yeah if you're getting some magnesium, I think that's... that's and brilliant. showering before I go in, mm. it helps keep the water clean if that's what you're into. Totally. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, Tom, really appreciate you coming on and sharing all this, this wisdom. This a pleasure. Uh, Forge.com, that's going to be yep. the website. And then you're working on a book that's going to talk about the science of deliberate cold exposure yep. as well as the experiences, which I think are phenomenal. And uh, your goal to get that done is uh, coming up pretty soon here, fall. Yeah, classes yeah. start in August. And I want to have this thing drafted into the editor this gives me almost two and a half weeks and i'm only six of the ten chapters done so i got some more writing to do yes. but you go to morosco forge you click on the journal tab and you're going to see almost all the articles you can go to seager tp s-e-a-g-e-r-t-p dot substack dot com you can mm -hmm. pre-read some of the chapters i love getting the feedback because I don't really know what it reads like. I've been living this stuff and telling these stories. So when people say, I didn't understand the part about where you skipped over brown fat or mitochondria or whatever, um, it really helps me there too. That's awesome. And then hopefully um, you've self-published. Mm -hmm. I sent this to the same publisher that did Brain Energy for Chris Palmer, same publisher that did uh, Why We Get Sick for Ben Bickman. Um, all about insulin resistance. It's Ben Bella books. And I love those books, but I don't think they want to talk to me about ice mm. baths. It might just be too edgy. So maybe it'll just be on Amazon and self-publishing. Yeah. that's Uncommon cold, I'm going to call it. I hope oh, you like it. Oh, I like that. Yeah. That's awesome. Right on. We'll appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you so much. Yeah. This has been a pleasure.